Are we live? Perfect. Uh, ja, wir kommen, wir kommen zurück in unserem Bitwäscherei Studio. Um, ich freue mich, einen neuen Gast ein, halt, den wir eingeladen haben, euch vorzustellen. Um, ich bin hier auch mit Valentina, habt ihr vorher schon gesehen. Um, ich bin Marc, um, über das Acteria Aktivitäten und unser Open Science Lab um, sind wir schon seit Jahren daran, einen Freund und Partner in Crime einzuladen, Adam Zeretsky, um auch bald hier vor Ort mit uns zu arbeiten. Ähm, wir haben also heute jetzt Adam Zeretsky eingeladen, eine kurze Vorstellung zu machen über, was er so denkt, über Gene, über Leben, über Evolution, über den Menschen und so weiter. Er wird einen Workshop machen am Mittwoch um 2 Uhr, Bioinformatics Hack mit Adam Zeretsky, Random Gene Coding. Um, er wird eine kurze Vorstellung geben, was er was euch erwartet am nächsten Mittwoch. Um, so we have invited Adam Zeratsky. He's originally from New York, I think maybe from Woodstock, but he just recently moved to Portugal and we invited him live tonight through a big blue button uh, to give an overview of his kind of approach to genetics, to code, to poetry and performance, uh, which is a little bit of a teaser of a workshop that we are planning on Wednesday at two o'clock. Um, I'm really happy he's here. I think he just arrived. There I see something in my screen. Um, so we will share our big blue button and we will mostly give the stage, or it's not a stage, it's a, it's a shed. Where do you live, Adam? I'm in a, I'm at Cultivamos Cultura in San, Sao Luis, uh, Portugal. Uh, the, the outpost uh, for bio artists uh, provided by Marta de Menezes. It's fabulous. Will, will, you, will you shoot some kind of aerosols at me? Do I have to wear the mask? Oh, you might because I have this vacuum, you know, but it's uh, repurposed for my face. Okay. It's just clean air. So, yeah, Adam, we'll, um, I really enjoyed working with you over the last couple of years. I think it has been influential on how, how to do workshops, how to deal with kind of deep topics of humanity and life and everything. Um, I have a, a translator here, so she can translate everything you say in Russian, if you want. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and um, we will, maybe, when you like give, a, give you a full head, I will maybe turn off my microphone huh, and give you a time. If you just yell at me and I can come back to turn it on. Okay, and if I want to go to the slideshow... I it's just... already there, in fact. It's there. Everybody, the whole world sees your slides. Okay, fabulous. So are we a go? I think so, and we can even make the slides a little bit bigger, or maybe half half. What do you like? Yeah, whatever you half, half, half. Yeah, perfect. There you are. All right. So, um, well, I'm here uh, to introduce the lab. This is a, a lab, and it, originally it was called DNA Dice. Uh, it's an icosahedron that I made out of uh, laser printing onto an old sail of a boat, and I put all the 20 amino acids on each side of this icosahedron. And the idea was to roll a random sequence of DNA and then try to find it inside of a bioinformatic database. Um, and, you know, things are a little different now. I think, you know, uh, ordinarily I would just like introduce, if we go to the lab, we'll introduce this sort of codec, which uh, shows you how to make triplets. Um, the triplets, if you can see them, are um, all the possibilities of A, T, G, and C. And that adds up to 64 triplets, but there's only 20 amino acids. So we have some kind of redundancy, which is similar to your hand. If you notice, there's redundancy. There's extra fingers just in case you lose one, you, you still have another. Um, the same goes for your nostrils. If you notice, you have two eyes and two nostrils because you can lose one and still see. It's fabulous. I like. I love redundancy. It's part of life, anyway. Um, but ordinarily, ooh, ordinarily, I would do a hands-on lab, right? But what do we have here? 
we can't do anything hands-on these days because we can't gather in giant groups because of COVID. So um, instead of squeezing all kinds of goop through cloth and getting DNA out of it, we're just going to sort of um, look at what the lab will be without it. So what I'll suggest is, although this is fabulous, you can sort of see that as you add a G and a T and an A or a C, you get valine, which is a V. These letters coincide with the alphabet. It could These letters could be anything. They could be pseudocode. They could be um, anything you want them to be. And you sort of go around, uh, if you make a letter with, uh, so what we'll do is we'll write sort of um, words and then we'll translate the words backwards, like reverse engineer them into DNA. Um, and then we, we can search them online in a sort of Google database for what would you call it? Now, I would rather work with the DNA from pigs and cactuses and fruits and things like that, but we're gonna do what we can. Um, uh, so I want you to come, if you come to this lab, come ready with either a pen and a pencil or one of those fancy tablets or some kind of cell phone uh, that you can draw with or we can draw online, whatever. It's a drawing lab, it's, it's not that big a deal. There's a little bit of access um, to uh, bioinformatics databases, but we will get there, not sure. Um, but in general, we're dealing with DNA. Um, DNA is found in many places. Here's a rock that has worms on it, right? Big worms, little tiny worms. You see the little worms, all the kind of worms. These worms might have some DNA in them, even these little tiny worms down here. Oh, look at that little worm. Hello, little worm. Oh, so um, instead of uh, isolating DNA and trying to figure out what it is and maybe blowing it through micro injection into people's bodies, um, we're going to sort of have a dryer lab where we we add up letters into A's, T's, G's, and C's, which are these sort of like amino acids that we all use and sometimes use as sports uh, accoutrements. And we're going to um, do other things than what we do generally with DNA, which is to kind of go through the difference between programming and programming life, right? I mean, we're, we're looking at a text to flesh interface. Now, this lab, Mark and I did, uh, this is a picture from when we worked in Moscow, where we gold leafed this apple with some DNA and nanoparticles of gold. And here in San Francisco, we went to the Swiss embassy and we used the nanoparticles of gold mixed with DNA to blow gun, shoot them into my balls. Um, I don't think we're gonna be doing this in the lab, um, but it is possible to take a sequence that you develop in the lab, get it sequenced with the DNA sequencer, print it, and mix it with nanoparticles of gold. And there's a protocol on how to use a blow gun to actually turn it into a gene gun, a biolistic device. And you too can shoot these little DNA particles into your balls or your ovaries, um, thereby making yourself potentially a giver of transgenesis. Well, that's nice. Um, but right now, I did this DNA lab on a Zoom meeting in, in Halle, Germany, the, the other day, and it worked pretty good. Everybody was doing it in their kitchen, and, and uh, it's not as fun, but it does work. Um, what I would like to say is, I'm gonna just, I'm putting these up to just let you know that if you make a triplet, say a C, A, G, it turns to O, uh, one of the amino acids, and if you check down there, uh, oh, that's Q, that's glutamine, right? So, I mean, it's fairly simple. T, A, C becomes Y, and that's tyrosine. And so you can just sort of stack up the letters. If you want to go the other way, you can spell something like T, A, D, TAD. And then that would be an alanine, aspartic acid, starting with a threonine. Um, and so this is sort of like briefly explaining how to turn text into a DNA sequence. Um, but, you know, I want you to feel this because by showing you these graphics, you get the idea. 
And these are the redundancies again. This is glycine, G, which is GLY, but also these four triplets, like these four fingers. They all equal gly uh, glycine. Um, so that's my little intro to DNA. Um, obviously, these letters are completely arbitrary except for the start codon, methionine, ATG, which is sort of like the beginning of every gene, and the stop codons. Um, the stop codons, there's more than one. There's actually three termination or stop codons, which are uh, also methionine, but they're TAA, TAG, or TGA. And that's the end of every gene. So it's almost like, I don't know, there's a capital letter at the beginning of a gene, and then there's punctuation at the end, whatevs. Um, so I'm just sort of getting this across to you with these graphics, but um, during the lab, we'll take words and then translate them to DNA, and then we sort of end up drawing the word and then looking for these DNA sequences in bioinformatics databases. Now, this lab, on the other hand, is brought to you by an artist. I'm a bioartist, and so I kind of prefer to have my light swinging and say something, uh, we're in Germany right now, about um, mutation uh, relating to craft, craft work, is it? So if you understand the reference, um, mutations are nonsense, nonstop, techno pop okay that was a really bad one-liner oh so is that that's homelander from the boys in the garbage sorry reference oh shit here more homelander sorry just memeing um so i developed this icosahedron icosahedron type of thing and it's available as a pdf up on the wiki the hacketeria org wiki wiki and you can download it if you want to, and you can actually cut it out and make your own rollable die. Because I'm interested in the relationship between random poetry and the random mutation that made us, right? We're made of DNA. We're made of sort of text to flesh. And the text that makes our flesh is fairly random. That's why we're a little bit different from say a fish or a wolf, et cetera, right? Does that make sense? Yes, I'm just trying to help. And if you notice in here, there's, we'll zoom in on this later, but there's methine has the start codon and the three stop codon. So I made the start codon a capital letter and the three stop codons are a period, an exclamation point and a question mark. That is questionable in the world of science, but it's for any other system. Uh, here we go. So, um, what I want to do today is this is this is sort of well this is it more uh, detailed right methionine uh, the start codon is a capital letter and then we have a period T A A the question mark T A G and the exclamation point T G A um, so I don't know I'm just trying to make sure that you know that some genes have exclamation points at the end and some genes have question marks at the end. That might not make much sense, but neither do genes. Actually, we're a mess. Like, we're not most elegant. We are a mess of, like, very, very, very um, unoptimized hard drives, right? Um, and that's all right. I like being a mess. I'm personally mess friendly. Um, let's see if this slide comes up. Oh, so here's the lab, how we might have done it, except for I can't click it. If someone can click that video, it's about 14 seconds. So if we don't get it, it's okay. Um, but it's online. We'll go with it. So this is the place that we'll be going to. It's one of a few different um, bioinformatics databases that are public. There are private databases um, where the human genome is copyrighted and uh, secured for pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. But this is the BLAT search genome. And you would take your sequence. We'll go there. It's online. It's at UC Santa Cruz. And there's another one, a mirror site in Europe. Um, and you type your sequence in here, right? Your sequence here. As long as you click search all and um, all results, no minimum matches and hit submit, or as if it was some kind of Google device, um, you could hit, I'm feeling lucky and get the hit, you know, that it brings up for you. Um, that's really nice. I like the reference. <laughs> And then um, 
what it searches is the genomes that have been sequenced throughout the life world. So it searches through golden eagle. It searches through, you know, American alligator, the painted turtle, the garter snake, um, African clawed toad frogs. And there are labs that study all these animals and they took the time to sequence their genomes. So I know that the African clawed toad frog is called Xenopus and albino Xenopuses are delicious, but don't eat the skin, it's kind of poisonous. Um, they're called Xenopus because they have strange feet. Uh, they have five fingers on their back claws, but they only have three toenails. The others have no toenails, so that's strange. Well, whatever, whatever. They got the fugu fish, the stickleback, the tetradon. Um, and what this search engine does is it searches for homologies, like something similar inside the organism, um, some kind of sequence that seems like it relates to this particular gene on this particular chrono chromosome in this particular tetradon. Um, and after it searches, it finds basically like hits, like, oh, you know, like a search engine. And it says, wow, well, number one, we found here in the third chromosome of yeast. That's pretty cool. Um, and here it is in the, you know, some chromosome inside of the alligator. And this is the gene that has a portion of your text deeply inside of it. Now, I would say um, this is kind of cool. And as you go further in, it gets weirder and weirder, right? You get into like where your gene is on the chromosome and literally you're dealing with an interface where you can zoom in, but instead of like imagery or websites, you're finding out more and more about where the gene is and what it does. And scientists are pretty cool. All these are clickable and interactive and eventually they get to like the name of the laboratory that studies this gene and the name of the scientist that's the that's in that lab and you can, and sometimes it has their email. You can email them and say, hey man, I wrote a poem and like I typed it into the, you know, genome search engine and I found your name. So like we're basically related, right? And that won't work, but it's worth a try. Um, this is text-driven generation of novel protein structures. This is the name of an article by Eugene Thacker that um, got me kind of going on this. I, it was early on uh, before BioArt even was a word. And um, he was talking about what can we do with biomolecular writing, right? And a lot of people take a text and put it into DNA and then think about sequencing it. Um, a lot of people think about uh, bio bricks and synthetic biology, what we can do to, you know, um, stick a movie into a E. coli and retrieve it and find it to be all jaggy and kind of like corrupted. Um, because life continues to mutate even when you use it as a hard drive. Um, I don't personally appreciate the idea of genomes being data. I don't really like that. I like them more as poetry, to tell you the truth. But this sort of thing where you can go to BLAST or you can go to FAST, FASTA and look for um, homologies, like similarities, and try and find, find your poem inside uh, an organism it's weird because the idea is that you wrote a poem that's completely arbitrary how you translated it into DNA. And then your arbitrary poem turns out to already exist inside of an organism. Um, unbeknownst to you, the poem had already been written by life. And so there's almost nothing you can say or nothing you can think that doesn't already exist in the genome of any, any, you know, any myriad of organisms out there. This one was sent by Hubert just the other day through Mark. And it's a, this is the sequence of the vaccine against COVID. Um, and you can see there's C, A, T's and G's. I think that they translated some, some of the T's into some kind of epsilon or something um, to freak out, actually to, to freak the system. Um, and he was sort of writing about this, which I find amazing. Okay, this machine is the interface between your keyboard and DNA. You literally type your sequence in and it's, it's dumber than you think. There's four bottles, one of A, one of T, one of G, and one of C. Literally bottles of, you know, like the different, <laughs> it's sort of ridiculous. The base pairs are in there and like you, and there's a buffer and it just, 
the arm slides back and forth. It slides to A and then it slides to buffer and it rinses the A onto like a little tiny sphere and the A hangs there and then you go to the buffer and it drops off any other A's and then you go to T and it hangs after the A and you buffer it. It's kind of like silk screening or, you know, I mean, it's really not that rigorous robotics. Uh, I think we, we, we're working on our own miniaturized one with Earths, right? So this is a DNA printer, but it's basically, to me, it's a text to flesh machine, right? You literally can type a poem and then make it into something that's uh, contagious, you know, that can be inserted into the genome of a living organism. That's messed up, but it's kind of interesting. Um, just to break, and I'll slow down. I realize I'm speaking a little too fast for a multilingual group. Um, I have a short question, Adam. Yeah. So with all that poetry that you already blasted through the blast search engine, what what was some kind of weird thing or like that you found or like the weirdest animal it ended up or maybe some maybe anecdote from some person that you contacted? Well, this is kind of interesting. This is what we do with the lab is we, we end up finding a gene. We draw the interface of the bioinformatics database and we draw the gene. Then we draw where it is in an organism. And then sometimes we find a scientist and we draw their face. Um, <laughs> one thing that we found was um, in inside of a pituitary gland or inside of a Malaysian bass. So it was inside the brain, of the gland in the brain of the Malaysian bass that helped to decide its gender. And then we found a scientist in, in Kuala Lumpur who was studying this gene, who had put up the original sequence. And so I wrote to him. I haven't heard from him yet, but I'm waiting. Um, but in the name of COVID, I want to recommend this. This is just a vacuum cleaner with the top taken off. And um, instead of wearing a mask, I think you might want to just, if you, this thing sort of sucks in the air here, and uh, uh, if you turn it on, it sucks in the air, and it can blow clean air through a HEPA filter into your face. It looks kind of like this. You see, this is pretty good. Um, and if you have something like this, you can sort of like tuck it in your pants and then just walk around with it in your face, you know, like. And then you don't really have to worry, you have filtered air. I mean, I feel bad for the people next to you because all your air is getting blown on them, but it's kind of a nice effect. I thought I'd just share, you know, creativity is everywhere. Um, but you, you can try this at home. Oh, all right, there you go. Um, so, uh, <laughs> in any case, back to the slideshow. Uh -huh. um, so we're looking at this uh, icosahedron, and like I said, all the amino acids are on it. Um, the fact that they use Y or C or N has something to do with the name of the amino acid. They use 20 of the 24, you know, US alphabet, but I know there's other letters in German, but you could also add umlauts. You can change some of the letters. I did here, like I, I changed this to Y or uh, O, like so that there would be an O. Um, but this is like, you know, there's a few different ones where I added letters, but I was thinking that actually the coders out there might want to use pseudocode or things from C or C sharp or Pascal or Java, whatever you're using, um, and just throw in some pseudocode and see, you know, find a sequence and see what code it codes for or vice versa. Um, so this is sort of a back and forth, um, I like hanging out at RC3. It's pretty cool. I've been over to this little uh, 2D world and it's been kind of fun. Um, and so I just want to uh, sort of ground this and let me see if I can stretch the screen so I can read this. I put these a little close to the side, sorry. Um, but I don't know how to say this. There's a lot more going on than I let on. I'm sort of lighthearted about this, but I'm going to switch hats, right? Um, when it comes to adding genes to the testicles and ovaries of life, when it comes to making transgenic humans, 
I'm not really sure if I'm pro GMO. I, in fact, I'm definitely not just pro GMO, but I, I'm not really sure what it means uh, to be the person that chooses the genes and to be the person that technically introduces them into another organism's reproductive genome. Right. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a bother for me because I don't think we're just made of code. We can recode genomes, but I don't think we're made purely of code. So I'm not sure what le what that leaves, but it's not a dry code, at least. It's um, if you're trying to, you know, deal with things like re-engineering the human genome, you're kind of being a vampire. You're piggybacking on nature and that's OK, but you're kind of as you bring something like immortality of your idea into the human genome, you're also making people into zombies. Okay. So I just want to sort of lay that down. I have a few more little points like that. Like, Oh shit. I just don't give a single fuck about Homelander. Sorry. Memeing the boys. That's just low brain, low, low brow. Sorry. Um, so I guess, uh, the subtext of what I'm talking about is, this guy, Dr. He, uh, from Shenzhen, right? Who helped make Lulu and Nana, uh, the transgenic twins. And he put a gene into them, uh, into, he mixed it with the father's sperm and injected the sperm into the egg. And now they are born as the first official transgenic people, um, with his own desires, his own, um, enhancements, right? And this is sort of assisted reproductive technology, but it's also a new kind of sex. So he kind of had sex with these babies before they were born. I'm not sure what I think about that. Um, but. Um, I have, yes. I, I don't know, I, I have a present for you. Huh. All right, break it in here, let's hear it. Look what I have here, I have a mug. <laughs> That's a hackatory mug, isn't it? No, it's the make your own CRISPR baby mug. Oh, that's excellent. So I would say, yeah, I'm coming to get it. This is fantastic. I love swag. Hold on, I'm going to breathe a little. One second. Oh, there, I feel much cleaner. Um, so I don't know if you can tell, but we're we're talking about lots of different systems. We're talking about code, we're talking about language, we're talking about poetry, we're talking about DNA, we're talking about reproductive um, technology, like you know, assisted reproductive technology, and we're talking about mixing all these systems with living beings. You know, the, the trunk of an elephant and the tentacle of an octopus. It's a little bit uh, hentai, but it's a, and it's a little bit rock and roll, but it's also a little bit oh heavy handed. Um, so what I'm interested in getting across, especially at a conference where people code, is how to engage uh, playfully with bioinformatics, but also how to think about bioethics in terms of what it means to recode life. Um, and basically this talk is just to get you interested in coming down and check it out. But also um, if you can understand that I'm talking about synthetic biology and I'm talking about standard codes like subroutines, embedding programs, uh, even gene drives. But I'm also talking about keeping your mind adapt, adept and adapted to the relations. Um, because it's not just like, do you think of yourself as just data processing? Uh, do you think of yourself as somewhat cognizant? Do you think of yourself as a factory or is that a little bit irritating? Um, it, it sort of matters to me because, oh, there's a little bit of, um, a little bit of horror in every um, insertion of genes. It's not so hard with E. coli, but once you get to rabbits, you know, you have to give some hormones and collect the eggs and kind of make them pseudo pregnant and then alter the eggs and add some sperm and then re implant them. It gets a little bit, mm, a little gorier than most code, right? Most code, you're not implanting eggs inside of the uterus of a rabbit. So, what does it mean to um, do this kind of input output, right? Um, so, I'm offering 
bioinformatics to open up the world and the map of the world of biodiversity. It's cool. Um, and I'm talking about the search engines online and sort of the data dumps and different editing software and ways of data mining, ways of um, get going from, you know, a text file on your computer to genetic engineering to um, life actually carrying your, what you typed into the keyboard in its, not just in its flesh, but it, in its, um, in its balls, in its ovaries, in its babies, right? So like this multi-generational um, organismic hack. The other thing I talked to um, my wife, Talila, I talked to her the other day and I said, well, I, I don't understand. What am I trying to say? And she said, well, all hackers, they may not know it, but hacking is always queer, right? It's different from your regular programming. You're trying to sort of like navigate and rebuild. And, and I mean, hacking itself is a queer process. So I was pleased to hear that because it sort of helped me. Um, it was a relief. Uh, hacking genomes, hiding ciphers in genomes, hiding MP4s in genomes, hiding, uh, you know, programs inside of chromosomes is actually kind of, it has the potential to be like freaking a phone or, you know, you might produce some kind of really obscure secondary metabolite, like a paste that you could rub on your forehead or something like that. Mark, you have any forehead paste? I'm 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 working on it. I I have this thing growing up at the moment. <laughs> I'm gonna um, switch my hands back. Let's I think you it. made a fantastic point uh, about this like queerness of that we are able to do, yeah. like using genetic code. A lot of discussion. In fact, if I listen to like your whatever beginner yeah. transhumanist discourse, oh, I can live forever. Yeah. It's not such a queer idea, and there's like rumors that this has been promised this by many peoples before, and they build churches around it. So, um, and I think that the queerness of of even of even looking at the, the DNA, it all looks queer. If you look close enough, close enough at the, the, the genetics, at whatever life itself, it gets so queer. Yeah, I think it's something that's missing out a lot in this line of GMO debate. Uh huh. It's and very. I know that um, kangaroos have seven nipples in their pouches, and each nipple makes a different a different milk. So the embryos from the the kangaroo are not even formed. They kind of stump their way up into the pouch, and then they suck nipple one. And when they grow to a certain point, they suck nipple two, and they just go down the line until they're joeys. It's kind of sweet, but it's a little bit obscure. Um, I, I remember I remember dissecting a snail the other day. It's weird. It's queer, and we love it. And I think a lot of the I mean, love of life is exactly its queerness, and it's pretty much the opposite of a lot of the synthetic biology talks, huh? Yeah, and like, the sort of singularity and perfectionism. Uh, you know, there's only there can't be only one way to become perfect. There has and, to be like, multiple ways. Like, and as I now understood the 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 experiments we're going to do together on Wednesday. Um, whatever weird shit I can come up with, I will find it already. And it's even weirder because it's part of a bigger weird animal that does have seven nipples and, and kind of grows babies out of its of backside or something. Yeah. And I think this is, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Um, you want to translate everything no, no, into no, Russian? Question. One okay. question. In Russian? Oh, yes. A small question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm not a biologist, I'm a sociologist, but my question is, is DNA information always a sequence format or not? The sequence and DNA information is always together or not? Well, that's a really good question. Some genes are all over the place because over time they've gotten fragmented. Like, that's why the singularity people want to optimize our genetic <laughs> hard drive. Um, I would say that once things are translated, that there's alternative editing that goes on and different shape proteins come from one gene. Also, many genes don't get called. They don't get called on the telephone unless you drink milk or someone slaps you in the head or you, know, you go cross-eyed. Different genes express according to the outside environment. So they're not like just running on empty. They're not just running all the time. They need to be, if you hear a bird call, 
different genes are expressed inside of your body. And if you don't hear the bird call, then you, those genes won't express. Um, as far as the sequence, there's a lot more going on in life than DNA. Some people call uh, this gene fetishism. In other words, there's things going on in the cytoplasm, the intercellular matrix outside of the cells. People have ignored it. It's like... I think it's called extracellular matrix, just to be a shit wise. <laughs> yeah. yeah, extracellular matrix is like the ether, but it's not empty. And this junk DNA that people have been calling junk for so long, turns out to have a whole lot of things going on inside of it. It's not, it's the good junk, you know. Um, you know what Valandina has been doing, she's using, I would say, there may be also one dimensional or two dimensional tables of data and she's putting them into the third dimension as a kind of creative and also kind of as a performative and also experimental approach to visualize something that is, it is just numbers that are on a table, but she puts it in 3D. And I think the DNA is even weirder. Huh? It is yeah. kind of numbers, call them letters, and they're like behind each other, but then they're also, you know, as you say, distributed all over this kind of string. But then there's many of those strings. And yeah. they even like mesh together, like in the most crazy way we can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow this tertiary or three dimensional structure, and there is like some time zones even there, how these molecules wiggle, and it yeah. kind of influences a bit like that. And I think, yeah, so I think far beyond this kind of linearity. It's totally cool. I think I, I have this feeling that I looked, when I look at a cell, I see this endoplasmic reticulum. And that's like where the proteins hang out while they're getting into their folded, you know, sort of positions. And proteins are actually moving and they're hanging out in the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look at it, it looks exactly like where I would want to have a rave. Like all the sofas are different shapes and sizes and they're, they look soft. And I'm like, they're just they're just hanging out together like sort of doing dancing yeah and i mean there's a there's that and then you know the essence of life seems to be all the mistakes that happen along the way so you can have all kinds of sequence data but um those syntax errors come from actually the machinery malfunctioning like having hiccups in the middle of translation those hiccups are what made us more than one set, like unicellular creatures like it's what designed the nose it's what where mm -hmm. all the biodiversity of the world comes from and comes then from. a photon comes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like dancing and wiggling and the photon comes and it, ah, they kind of <laughs> you know break one leg over the other side and suddenly like you could grow like two eyes no we yeah. already have eyes but a third eye <laughs> a third second eye i'm gonna have to breathe for a second hold on some heavy shit i think that was that was fantastic adam i'm really looking forward we will have one or two people in our open science lab over 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 there yeah um to join physically with the computer and also do the drawings and stuff yeah uh, i'm we we'll use this kind of bleak blue button as well it's announced in the program um it's yeah. like the hacteria bleak blue button thankfully yeah. like you know established on the digital gesellschaft so even people people without a ticket can join our workshop they can check on the website, hectira.org or something. It's all published there. So, so, I mean, the important thing is to remember that we're drawing, right? Yeah. It might be on a tablet, it might be on your phone, but that we're drawing. We're going to draw our poems, but we're also going to draw the interface, like, like the bioinformatic interface. But we end up drawing also, if we can get into it, we draw the gene, we draw the part of the organism it's in, we draw the organism, and we even draw, if we can, we draw the lab or the scientist that it comes from. And then we end up with this drawing that's all these drawings at once. It's kind of a hybrid of its own, which is showing that there's very little difference between literature and genes, but also that there's, there's, there's room for thought about what, what the role of poetry is in the development of life. So that's, that's important. The other thing for people out there that are really, whoa, 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 whoa. Really into coding. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. It's a. I'm can you fart? Can we make like a Trojan horse or some kind of like, you know, uh, can we hack the genome in a different way? Uh, because people are really like, oh, can I put a poem in an E. coli? And I'm like, can we make a kind of, if we're hacking the genome, can't we make it, make something like a Trojan horse? Like a, I'm not talking about making our own virus, but maybe put a virus in the virus.
I don't know. It's old fashioned, but I like it. Uh, since it's fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, well, this is it. I'm going to say good night, and I'm going to sleep better for having done this. But uh, um, I look forward to seeing you at the lab. Yeah. Everybody Fantastic. Come. Fantastic, Adam. Thanks a lot, man. You Thanks deserve the mug. You'll get the mug. See you. Make your own crisp for babies. Bye, Mark. Take care. Ciao. There he goes. Um, I think, yeah, I'm looking forward both of, to the workshop, to the workshop on Wednesday at two o'clock. But I'm also really looking forward to continue this collaboration. So he will come physically to Zurich, hopefully in mid March or April, and we kind of can then do some laboratories here, do some experiment, and learn kind of to make what he just said this kind of weird poetry Trojan horse kind of um, dinosaurs. Um, I have sad news for you, Adam. I say goodbye to you there, like I put on the camera, but the other people don't even see you anymore, so they already said goodbye to you. Oh, that's fair. Was there Adam, more I than see you, see you around? Huh? Maybe we can hang around in our work adventure on the island or chill a bit in the lab or whatever. Go to the lobby and be like ants. I'll meet you oh. on the island, man. <laughs> Sounds good. That was fun. Much well done. I look forward. All right, signing off for now, Mark. Take care. Watch Ciao. out. Doink.